Hi guys, welcome to CA Inter Financial Management MCQs. I'm C. Anu Jalota. We are on a mission to be doing every possible question, but with proper logic. Now, FM is one subject that you all have studied a bit, but that will help you a lot in your personal finances. It will always help you to understand where you should be investing, what is the minimum rate that you want, okay, and how much return a particular scheme is giving, etc., etc. You will always come to be knowing, especially through chapters like cost of capital, whereby you have to be fetching like, you know, the IRR, the capital budgeting chapters, all these chapters, like, you know, whether an insurance policy is good or bad, what kind of the cash management you all should have and so on. Let's start it off the question for today. Just before I start one small thing, all our lectures of costing of CA Inter of my previous batch are available on YouTube. They are coming every Saturday, Sunday, free of cost for everybody. First, we are launching all the lectures in English in the mix. Once that thing is done, all the lectures only in English language. So that will cover up all the students who only want English lectures also. And uh, in case you want to be buying my latest course of costing, then the link will be there in the description or alternately you all can uh, contact us. The link will be there below. Let's start it off uh, the question for today. This is capital structure chapter. The assumptions of Modi Gilani Miller, that is MM, hypothesis of capital structure do not include the following. Uh, the assumptions are what? Capital markets are imperfect. Okay. Investors have homogeneous expectations. All firms can be classified into homogeneous risk class. I'll say something about part C so therefore you all will understand like you know what does it mean. Now Modi Glani and Miller see you all should understand that every company is different. Every company has different risks and therefore there are different rewards. Example a company like uh, say a company like Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. The risk of that company is very different as compared to Reliance. Okay example say Hal is there. Uh, Halis Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Now that company is there in the defense sector. So therefore in case of wars, okay, this company has a maximum chance of growing up. Why? Because there'll be more orders from the government of India and might be in future from export markets also. Okay. But reliance is mainly there for the consumer goods or for petrol or for geo. So risks are different. When you say assumption number C, you know this point number C, all the firms can be classified into homogeneous risk class. Modi Glani and Miller in order to simplify the uh, theory they all had told that all the firms can be classified into homogeneous risk class means all the companies have similar kind of risks okay similar kind of risk whether it is operating risk or it is financial risk you know risk means leverage you all have done that thing in chapter number six so therefore that was one of the assumptions okay so one hint i've told that c cannot be the answer okay d the dividend payout ratio is cent percent. Cent percent means 100 percent and there is no corporate tax. Okay, so in case you all know the answer, okay, kindly comment below. Okay, now see. Now, Modi Gilani and Miller, okay, uh, they told many assumptions, but main assumptions I'm trying to tell you all right now. There'll be few other things that I'll be saying once all these six assumptions are done. First one, uh, their assumptions, okay, were all around this. The first assumption, capital markets are perfect of complete information, which is available to all the investors. So what does this thing mean? It means that some information about the company is available to one investor. No, it is available to all the investors. It is not that I have some hidden information that other shareholders do not have. So all of us try to evaluate the companies in the same way. That is assumption number one. Assumption number two, investors can borrow the funds at the same rate. What does this mean? It means that suppose I want money, okay, say for any purpose, I can borrow that money at 10%. Okay. Now company, I'm not a company. Okay. I am an individual. I can borrow funds at the rate of 10%. Tomorrow, if company wants, they can also borrow the funds at 10%. So the investors can borrow the funds at the same rate. This is whatever second assumption means. Now, this assumption was required for arbitration. In case you all are aware of that, okay, then it uh, that thing was required for that purpose. Then the third one, investors can shift from one security to another without any transaction cost. For a small example, there is one company that has debt. So therefore, it has higher leverage. Leverage means risk. Risk arises due to debt. Okay. And there is one other company whereby there is no debt. There's only equity. Okay. If investor wants, they can shift from, say, a levered company which has debt 
to unlevered company without any transaction cost. What does this thing mean? Mean there is no STT, security transaction tax. Whatever amount you will get by selling in one company, same amount in entirety you can invest in the other company. That means there is no shifting cost as such. Again, this thing was a requirement for arbitration. Okay, and that is why this assumption was necessary. Fourth one, securities are divisible. Means even part shares are okay. You can buy say 120.32 shares. Okay, so you can be buying that. Okay, so that was the fourth assumption. Fifth one, all investors have seen probability distribution about future earnings. If suppose I think in future, a company like say ITC will do good, all other investors also think in the same particular way. So if you think that one company is going to be doing good, this theory assumes that all investors assume that this company is going to be doing good. Okay, six months slightly complicated. Personal leverage and corporate leverage are perfect substitutes. That is debt equity ratio of the levered firm is same as personal debt equity ratio of the investors. Once he shifts to the unlevered company. Now this is slightly a bigger one. See, <coughs> leverage means risk. Now risk in this case is measured by debt equity ratio. Higher the debt, higher will be the risk also. Okay. So this theory assumed that personal leverage and corporate leverage are perfect substitutes. What does this thing mean? Now corporate leverage. I'm a shareholder in a company. That company has some risk. Risk can be measured by debt equity ratio. Okay. So that company has some risk. Okay. In case I sell the shares of that company and I shift to an unlevered company. Unlevered company means that particular company that has no debt at all. Okay. Now I wish to be investing in that particular company. Okay. Now that company has got no risk at all. But then to shift from that levered company to unlevered company, I will have to be taking loan myself. So I am indifferent about me investing in a company that has debt. I am indifferent about that company whereby I am investing and has debt or okay whereby I myself I am having debt. My debt okay will give some kind of a birth to my personal debt equity ratio. Okay. So think it of like this that uh, you are an investor. You are investing in a company that has debt. So therefore you will also face that risk because you are a part owner of that. Okay. Now that is perfect substitute of suppose tomorrow I try to invest in a company that has got no debt. So therefore technically there is no risk but then might be to invest in that company which has got no risk. I'll have to be taking loan. So therefore then loan will be coming on to me. That will be my personal debt equity ratio. These are uh, you are in this case perf these two things are perfect substitutes perfect substitutes means whether you have this or you have this it does not make a difference. Okay, so let's go over to the answer now. Now, the assumptions of MM hypothesis of capital structure do not include the following. Assumption number A. Capital markets are imperfect. I think this assumption is directly false. You all will understand this. In fact, the first assumption that we all did, capital markets are perfect of complete information, which is available to all the investors. So therefore, everybody has the same information. Okay. So therefore, capital markets are perfect. That is whatever this theory had assumed. So therefore, A should be the answer, but I'm reading out the other ones also. Investors have homogeneous expectations. I think this is an assumption. Okay. Because there is assumption number five all investors have the same probability distribution about the future earnings so everybody is expecting like you know that like you know whether it is you or it is me or it is anybody else we all have we all have same expectations about a company suppose this company will give 10 percent return not only you think that i also think that okay third all the firms can be classified into homogeneous risk class okay now this thing means that all the companies we assume that have the same amount of risk and that is why there was assumption number six also actually. So whether a company has risk or you as an individual investor has risk, okay, both of them are personal substitutes, both of them are perfect substitutes. So even C1 is an assumption D. Now this I had not discussed but try to recall your theories of capital structure. The dividend payout ratio is cent percent and there is no corporate income tax rate. If you all remember, if you all remember, we all had make a, made a income statement. Okay, our income statement was something like this. Uh, EBIT, less interest will give you EBT. Less taxes will give you PAT. Okay, PAT divided by number of equity shares. Okay, will be giving you all EPS. I'll say this thing once more. This theory had assumed that 
first of all there are no preference here that also assumption you all can write if you all want okay so try to be thinking there is no preference dividend okay second this theory had assumed that there is no income tax also okay so therefore in this case ebit minus interest will give you ebt but there is no tax so therefore this will be equal to pat also okay so ebit minus interest will give you pat there is no preference dividend so therefore this will be profit for equity and this theory had assumed that your dividend payout ratio is 100%. That means whatever you earn, you give it back to the shareholders in form of dividends. So therefore, there is no retain earnings fund over here. So therefore, we all had made, if you all remember, three-liner income statement under these theories. And that was EBIT minus interest will be giving you all, in this case, the dividend. Okay. This was one thing that we all had done. Okay. So even fourth one is an assumption. I'll repeat this last thing once more. EBIT less interest should be giving you all EBT, but there is no tax. So therefore that will be pat also less preference dividend. There is no preference shares also. So therefore this will be profit for equity. And this entire thing is given as uh, dividend. This was the assumption, not only in MM theory, but also in like, you know, uh, all the theories that we all had done in the chapter of capital structure. You had a traditional theory, if you'll remember, you had net income theory, you had net operating income theory. In all these theories, this was an assumption. Okay, so even D is an assumption. So I think so, I've discussed enough. Answer should be A over here. Capital markets are imperfect. That is the correct answer. I'll see you all next time with another question. Till then, please take care of yourself. Bye.